PI is about to do. It's one of the most cumbersome calculations in statistics, and literally no one does them by hand. Even OSU, the folks at OSU that make their kids do everything by hand, don't make them do this by hand. So that, that tells you something. That tells you something. But of course, at the same time, I want you to see what's going on. So here's a logic. Remember what this test is called when you're testing more than two means? ANOVA. It's called an ANOVA. Remember what, it, remember what, the, what the acronym is for? Analysis of variance. variance. What the hell is variance? Difference. What difference? Difference of what? In what way? Give me a little more specificity. I like that. What's it? What does variance measure? It's a 243 question more than anything, really, honestly. How far away it is from the average. How far from the average on average are the data points? And what makes it variance, that's perfect definition of standard deviation, which is a measure of variance. Yes, right. love it. The mathematical definition of what, or the statistical definition of variance itself is the square of that standard deviation, which creates some silly units. Like these are going to be feet squared because the units are in feet. So the variance is going to have units of feet squared. Remember this? Remember this from back? The SX squared command. Exactly. Is you'll see it up here momentarily. Yep. You'll, you'll see it up here momentarily. You'll see it right here. Yeah, it's a beautiful statistical construct. Unfortunately, it's practically useless, except in computations. And computations is awesome, because it's an unbiased estimator for sigma squared. But for conversational statistics, you wouldn't talk about square feet when you're talking about breaking. You talk about square feet to figure out how many tiles you've got to buy at Lowe's to do your bathroom, or to figure out how many gallons of paint you've got to buy to paint your walls. But square feet, you're talking about this is dumb, because it's linear feet. That's why we took the square root of it to get the standard deviation back in the day. But we have to use the variance in this calculation because it takes away a little bit of error that would exist otherwise. And that goes back to something you don't have to worry about remembering. I mean, the first day of class, we looked at a big, crazy spreadsheet that made you all kind of vomit. So here's the data. Same data you guys have in your TIs. I think we I have to take some points out, though. I didn't auto save it. We pulled the 9.9, .9, yeah? Uh -huh. And the 14.4, which is that skid. And the 14.2. 14.2? Yeah. 14.2 is gone. Yeah. I think okay. I think we pulled three. We pulled four or just three. I think twelve. Is this twelve three have to go then too? I think oh, so. we left the fourteen three, but pulled the twelve point. We left the fourteen three two, or, yeah, but pulled the twelve three. Oh, I do remember that. I do remember that because that little whisker right there shrank back to a to an acceptable amount, so to speak. Good. So hopefully, what you saw as we were doing this was you saw the box plot update right there. And the histogram over here update, the little purple guy in the back there, and the screen guy here kind of updated as we removed. You might not have seen the actual 14 4. It's, it's not that much of an extreme. Uh, shape of those three data distributions? Why? I don't know. I was riding my bike. I was not like, I'm waiting because data tends to do that sometimes. I'm riding my bike, I'm stopping on a hill. I mean, just I got little fluctuations. God only knows how many butterfly effect variables were going on. But just FYI, that is one of the requirements of ANOVA is that your data has to be arguably bell-shaped. So I was like, whew, got some good data. It actually works. Another requirement for the data, what do you think? Since we're testing averages. No outliers. No outliers. That's why I think it was so important to yard out those, those two extreme values because this might make it look like the average of this. It, the medians are actually very close, yes? The medians are a little, I can't figure out how to make the, those lines any wider. FYI, if anybody ever needs to make dot plot, or box plots in Excel, I've got a free, I, I made it and I can give it to you, I can email it to you. If you ever need it for a project or anything, uh, I can email you the template and just put your data into it and it pops up a box plot. It took a, it's a freaking ridiculous chart you have to make to do this, but I finally figured it out. So if anybody needs it, it doesn't have a built-in, there, no there is no box plot built-in. If anybody ever needs it, shoot me an email, boom. It's also in the Nova homework, if it's, it's linked in there too. So anyway, there's your box plots. Um, there's your histograms. So what's the first thing that looks, and this is why statistics is great, but your eyes are even better. What, what do you see by looking at the, at the data results? That they're close. What, what are close? The two leaders. The mini V and the full V look like they're extraordinarily similar. Might there be a tiny advantage with full V? Yes. Maybe, but it's too hard to eyeball. Right. What, what is not too hard to eyeball? I am really glad I got rid of these things. Yeah? yeah. At least it looks like the data right here. The entire data set is longer than even the shortest here. This is like the Mark Spitz, Michael Phelps analysis, right? The slowest time. Spitz's gold medal time in 72 was way slower than the last place guy in 2008 in the Olympic. Do you remember this from 243? You might remember, you might not. Totally fine if you don't. 
So it looks like cantilevers are completely off the chart, not even worth worrying about. Okay. But if you need to quantify and measure all three at once, suppose that's a control group, these are two experimental groups, which essentially they are, right? Essentially they are. My bike came with that, and I wanted to check, check these two. How do you do that? Well, that's where you can't just run t-tests. I mean, you could. You could. You could go tt, tt, and tt. Right, you could do that, yes? With one tiny problem. Your confidence is in the toilet. So you raise your confidence. So make up for that. But now it's in the toilet. Your other kind of error. That's the problem. Remember the problem with raising confidence is you, in it, you, abs you absolutely raise the chance of a type 2 error. If you raise confidence, you lower type 1 error. That's the definition, right? If, you bump your, if your confidence is at 95%, your, your type 1 error is at 5. Those always add to 100%. So if you raise your confidence to 99%, your type 1 is now at 1. But remember that if you did the quiz, which I think like three or four of you did, I apologize if you didn't get a chance to look at the spreadsheet. When you slide your confidence o meter over to make your confidence higher, that increases the type 2 error, this tail on the other curve that you can't see. It has to mathematically be raised. So if you can live with a type 2 error, if you can live with a type 2 error, that's okay, but it sounded like most of you guys couldn't live with a type 2 error with this, if I remember correctly, right? That's about as far as we got last time, was identifying the errors and then picking which one was our least favorite. I think somebody said type 2 is much worse because that means you actually would see an advantage of one break over the other, but you wouldn't see, but you wouldn't report on it, right? That'd be a false negative. Oh, the breaks are the same. Remember our null hypothesis? What's the null hypothesis? They're all the same breaking distance. A type 2 error would be accepting that when you shouldn't, when there is a difference, but you missed it. And somebody brought up a very good point that that's a safety issue, right? Yeah, that climbing harness is fine. Go ahead and clip in. Boop. And it, it breaks loose 300 feet in the air. That's a problem. You don't want to have false negative with stuff like safety equipment because that's bad. You want to err on the side of false positives. That's why cars get recalled all the time, yes? Anybody ever, ever, ever have a car recall done? Yeah, we just have one of our Jeeps. Like I told you guys, right, it gets rear-ended, apparently the, the trailer hitch might create a spark and light the gas tank on fire. That's a slight problem. A slight problem, but, you know, they'd rather err on the side of false positive than false negative in that case. Bringing in minor inconvenience to the person versus death, which seems like a false positive. It seems like a pretty good, pretty good balance. Good-ish? Good-ish. Okay, so... Sit back, check this out, because this is kind of an explanation of what ANOVA does. It's called analysis of variance. Why the hell would they analyze variances if we're talking about means? Why would they analyze variances if we're talking about means? It's, we're testing means, right? Because you have to know the worst case scenario. Oh, that's good. I hadn't thought about that. I wasn't thinking about that. That isn't what Fisher told me when I read his work. Actually, Fisher told me he's been dead for years. But when I read his work, he didn't mention about the worst case scenario. But what does variance include in its computation? What's in the computation for standard deviation, for example? What do you have to use to calculate it? The average. I mean, that's the whole definition of what the standard deviation is. It's average distance from average. So by looking at the variance, you can actually get a look at the average. I'm not saying this is the most logical, most concise. I'm just saying this is what analysis of variance is. It's pretty, pretty cool, too. So one way you can analyze the variance is taking all the sample averages, here they are, and you can see, you can see there definitely is a difference between the cantilever stopping distances and the mini and the full Vs. Okay, there they are right there. And I'm, now, I'm going to put the, the, the expected sample averages to all be this, this number mu. I'm calling them mu. Remember the null hypothesis says they're all the same? So they all have the same number, whatever mu is, I'm just calling it mu. I'm going to put that up there for reference for later. Then. I calculated the sample variances of each one of those. Those are in square feet, remember, square, square feet. Okay, so there's one, 4.56 square feet, which would mean its uh, standard deviation is about square root of that, so about two, it's a change. That one's about 16, 14 and a 15, about 15, so the square root would be about four feet, plus or minus. And then uh, full V, 26.4312. It's really hard to reach. Oh, it's hard to read? Yeah. Brady, can you fill that second set of lights? Are the zeros throwing those numbers off? They are now. Thank you for saying that, Kim. I was just there like, those go. numbers seem yep. wrong. There we go. That makes a lot more. Thank you. Yes, I forgot. 
I have this. I have this sheet tied to the first sheet, and I forgot Excel put zeros in. We have to do that over and over again. Hang on. Yep. Excel is smart enough to put. We'll just keep doing it. There we go. Thank you. And last but not least. There we go. Thank you. Beautiful. I was wondering why the variance of the canty was smaller than the variance of the middle. That doesn't make any sense. Let me go look at it. Beautiful. So we now have sample variances, and we have sample averages, and we have expected averages and expected variance. I'm calling them sigma squared for Is that a little bit better to see? Maybe a little bit. The green is awful. The color of the green is awful. What the hell? The light is off. Why is that one light still on? So make it, well, it's, it's okay, you know what, don't worry, because the important stuff is going to be in dark. The important stuff is going to be dark. Don't worry about that. This is just the data. The data is pulled over here. Get back up one more. All right, so what it's going to do, your, your acronym, everything that's going to be important is going to be in black, black font. Analyze the variances in two ways. Now check this logic out. This is the logic of it. It's going to create an estimate of the variance from the sample data in one way. Then it's going to create an estimate of the sample variance in a completely different way. And the completely different way is something you just saw with the M&Ms and the iPod. Totally freaking rad. And it's going to say, if the populations are the same, those two estimates should be about the same. If one grows out of proportion from the other too much, then it might look like the variances are growing out of proportion too much, which means the averages, therefore, have to be out of proportion. With one assumption, and this is what I don't like about ANOVA, this is why I think it gets overused. The only way that logic would be legit is if the populations had roughly equal variances to start with, because then the effect would change the average, not necessarily change the variance, but it would pull the second calculation like this. But you'd have to start with roughly equal variances. What is roughly that you just read my mind. I have yet to see a good quantifiable answer for how you measure. What, there are all kinds of tests you can do for a variance check. Uh, there's a Russian name which I'm forgetting now. So there are things like, remember in 243, uh, the Pearson second skew coefficient for how skewed is too skewed? There are similar computations for that as well. But I'm going to take a quick pause here. The reason why I, I, it troubles me a little bit, but it doesn't trouble me exceptionally, an exceptional amount, is your last question on your exam has you go on and Google non-parametric alternatives to these tests. There's a great one for the ANOVA. So if you can't say, oh, you know what, that is not close enough to that for me to be to me for me to like it, right? That's not close enough to that. Therefore, don't do an ANOVA. Do this other test instead. That's why it doesn't bother me too much. It doesn't bother me too much. We've got four and a half and Right, and the question is, is that close enough? We can run a test on that variance if you want to. I, don't, I want to focus on the mechanics rather than that, that, that explicit little piece right now. But you got to realize, if you run ANOVAs on the wrong kind of data or the wrong assumptions of data, you can get a result that's a total false positive because of that. Okay, so it's all good. So here's the first. Here's the first. The first estimate of the variance. Variance number one. What the hell? Let's just average the ones we have and call that an estimate. Right? Average them. Average them using, now this is the one kind of tricky thing. You use one less degree of freedom. When I say you lose, you don't use anything. Your technology does all this automatically for you. So essentially, you just average the three variances you already have. And you say, you know what? If they're roughly equal anyway, and there's no skew, if, if, if you feel better, weighted average them. That's fine too. It doesn't change it that much. You got three categories, each one has a variance, they're roughly the same, the sample sizes are roughly the same. Ah, but that plus that plus that divided by how many there are, boom. Average about 3.1 square feet. Kate's gonna say, wait a minute, time out, hang on. Hang on. You've got 4.5, 1.0, and 0.6. How legit is it to just add it divide by three? If, if it's fine, good, Jason's saying, not good at all. Good. Then you wouldn't run an ANOVA, you'd say you check a second test and see if it gives you a different result. Good, thank how you. How do you handle it, just go with the biggest when point. you say they're all different, uh, oh, K, K is like it was for goodness of fit, it's number of categories. Oh. It's just yeah, one less than that. That's why it's 3.1 and not slightly less. Because if you add up 4 plus 1 plus 0.6, that's roughly going to be 6. Divided by 3 would be 2. But divided by 2 is closer to 3. So the K is the cantilevers, the K is just how many categories you have? 
This will be three, and then the minus one is a two. Yeah, and again, that's just the degrees of freedom argument. Since you already have one variable accounted for, i.e. the average, you don't have to account for that one again. There's only two left to worry about. So, and that's an algebraic argument. Don't flush it out of your mind. You don't have to worry about it. That's one way. Here's the other way. And this is what I think is completely slick. This is what Fisher is, this is where I think Fisher really, really, uh, really oh, and FYI, You'll often see this called the sum of squares of the error or the mean square error if you average it. That, that number down there, that 3.1, is called a mean square error. If you ever see that in your research journals, that's what they're talking about, the averaged variances in the sample, mean square error. Most, it's usually done as an intermediate step. You'll see it again here momentarily in your TI. But it's an intermediate step, a means to an end. Here's the other means to the end. And this is what I think is really slick. This is when you, you do basically a chi-square analysis on the averages you already have. These are the averages you already have from your sample, 23, 16, and 16. Then you do what's called a grand mean, x double bar, which means you average all the data points you have and forget the fact that they're actually in three different groups. Now that makes perfect sense. If you forget the fact they're in three different groups and you're assuming that all the averages are equal, the individual averages of the three different groups should be close to that average. That hopefully makes sense. You remember, you're assuming your normal hypothesis is that there is no difference. So if all the groups have roughly the same average, and then you throw the groups away and put them all in the same pot, those two averages, if, if, you, if you will, should compare pretty favorably. So when you do that, that's what I did right here, there's your sample averages. Here is each of the sample averages minus this grand mean, which is 18.79 feet, 18.79 feet. So this one's above, these two are below, hopefully that makes sense, because this one actually is bigger than that 18, these are both smaller. And then here, remember O minus E squared? We like him, because he takes care of the positives and negatives canceling, giving us an inadvertent number. Boom, you take your chi-square, just like we did in chi-square, it ends up being 15.26 feet. Now, here's where you have to go back to 243 for about 30 seconds, and I mean 30 seconds. That is now what's called a standard error of the sample. And you remember something about standard error. It's the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the sample size. So that's why that is the standard error, which is definitely smaller than the variance in the population. You have to increase that by a factor of the square root of the sample size to get back to where it needs to be. When you do that, when you do that right here, you get your 305 square feet. Your 305 square feet. Now you might be asking why is it n and not square root of n? Remember it's the variance. So the standard deviation is divided by root n. The variance is going to be multiplied, uh, divided by n itself. And it ends up being 305 square feet. Now when you look at that number, how does that number compare to that number? Gut. Remember, the smallest it can be is the smallest either of those can be is zero. If there's perfect agreement, are they close? Is three close to 300? Forget statistical significance. Go with what your gut says. Oh. Right? Am I six feet tall or am I 600 feet tall? It's a slight difference in estimate there. No matter what your unit is, right? So this tells us. This tells us when we do the ratio of these two things. That's what the test statistic does. It takes those two estimates, ratios them up like this, and then asks, do you think they're the same? Now, the ratio of 305 to 3 is about 100, yeah? Go ahead. If they were the same, that would mean that our null hypothesis is correct. Looks to be correct. Now, this is how you measure it. Okay, thank you for the question. What, if they're the same, if they're the same, what value should this whole thing have if they're the same? One. That's perfect agreement. Perfect agreement. And if you look down here, here's the equation that I just put up just because I needed to graph the damn thing in Excel. Don't, don't sorry, don't look at it. Just let, let it go. Let it go. That's the curve that we're using to do this. There's one. Notice it's tied to a pretty extensive part of the curve. Where's ours? Good. Serena, she looked way over there. That's where it is. That's about 100, yes? It's way the hell over there. Off the curve. Does it look like it's on this curve? No. Conclusion, therefore, is at least one of those averages is different. So we know the cantilevers is different. But the problem is, and this is where ANOVA fails a little bit, Which one? Are of the other two, are they different from each other? And I'm going to put my hands up and say it doesn't matter. 
There are tests that are outside the scope of 244, unfortunately, that lets you then go in if you get a small p-value. I haven't given you a p-value for this yet. There's an intentional, intentional. We're going to use ti to do that for us. But that's it. That, that confirms the gut that something is different. This says, yes, something is different. But like Goff, it doesn't tell you which one. You need further testing for that. Yeah, Renee, go ahead. Are you saying the further away from yeah. one it is, the the more the more something looks like it's different. At least at least okay. one thing is different than the other two. Maybe even two are different than the, other, the, the, the third. If you got zero, you also be questioning if you were. If, if I got zero, I would be questioning my data. Yeah. Because what would that mean if I got a test statistic of zero? Zero variance. It, this this mean square of treatment, which was that last computation we just did, everything would have zeroed out. Just like at a chi, it is a chi square, right? So if you back up to this treatment, this guy right here, that would have meant that these exactly equal these, which means all of these would have been equal in the beginning. Now, not only that, what's, what's kind of cool about that, if they were all equal in the beginning and all the data was not variable, you wouldn't actually be able to get the numerical value of zeros. You couldn't get zero because this would be zero and that would be zero, which means you had a determinant form. And if you look really carefully, I don't know if you can see it, this thing's asymptotic at zero, it shoots off, which is, don't worry about why. It, it, it's undefined at zero because it can't be there mathematically and statistically because there's no variance. No, no variance. No variance means something wrong with the data. It means I'm breaking exactly at the same time each time, which is silly. Please, JC. Hellish. <laughs> With other studies, do they have one data point that, like, if they were doing three, one that's obviously not very similar, and then two that are? Because like, obviously we know that the cantilevers. Then you do what's called a post hoc analysis. If you ever need this, I've placed it into, I have to rename this section of your syllabus. It's, it's called homework right now. What it really is is just a, a resource area. In the home, I'll show it to you real quick. Is that where the graph is put up, or was it? It's, is that where the flowchart? Is there? Uh, is it there? I, I put it on the schedule page. It might be here too. JC, let me just answer your question a little bit, probably more than you want to have it answered, but just so you know where these things are if you need them. Can you go to 240? Or I get here. If you go to this home worksheet, write down to ANOVA testing. In here, it tackles a question of the, I use a different data set four cylinder versus five versus six versus, versus eight. Okay, and you run an ANOVA on this. Now, what happens when you run this ANOVA is you get a small p-value. Now, all that tells you, like it always tells you, is who do you believe, null or research? You believe in research, because you can't believe the null with a small p-value. It's too small. It's too small. There's too little agreement between the null belief and your data. But what it doesn't tell you is which ones are different? That's the problem that we never had to deal with until the beginning of last week with Goff and now with ANOVA. Because now you've got more than just two data sets. So you know there's a difference, but you don't know which one or ones have the difference. Does that, does that make sense? Is that fair? So with, with two proportions, it's easy. One's bigger than the other. That's, that's clear. With one, it's obviously simple. It's different than a number it's supposed to be. So what this does is it walks you through a procedure that actually allows you to test them individually without increasing your error un unduly. Now, the logic behind it is, it does involve increasing confidence, it does, but that's not gonna hurt us because we got a small p-value, right? We got a small p-value, which means what kind of error could we have made? Type, type one. one, we couldn't make a type two error, right? So you I can't make a type two error with a small p-value. When you increase your confidence, you're lowering your type 1, which is the only one you could have made, so it doesn't really matter. We're exactly, we're lowering our type 1, but here's the deal, too. We're allowing ourselves to run a number of different tests and maintain that 95. It's called a Bonferroni correction, I believe is what it's called. I forget what it is. It's called post hoc testing. So if you ever need to do this, or you need to back up a research study to see how they did it, I've got one for ANOVA in here, and I've also got one for Goff in the previous one, in case you ever need that. And this is the kind of thing... Because JC, great question. You're actually, let me see this. Let me show you what this in here. There it is right here. There's get better, get worse. Here's your, here's your bone for any for, for goodness of fit. You're able to go back and test the individuals. Because when are you going to read about these in research journals when something happened, right? Which means you got a small p-value. Which means you have to go back in and find out where they are. And they'll often say, we did post-op testing and here's what we found. 
Now you understand what they did. I, it, it's outside the scope of 244, but that drives me nuts because it's almost like saying, like, I know something really cool, but I can't tell you what it is. It's, it's late. That's how you do it. So this is my way of thinking around that. Now you've seen an ANOVA. You kind of know the messiness of how it works, but you also know how to deal with that and Goff and what happens with a small p-value. If you get a big p-value, nobody cares. Because if you get a big p-value, then your null's believable. If you get a big p-value, I just wasted all my time and money doing this test on brakes because I could have just left the cantilevers on because they're just as good or no better than V-brakes. What if you have a large ANOVA value? F. When you say that, well, that means a small, that's a small p-value, right? Because the larger, let me put the graph back up, Bernay, thank you for the question. If you have a large F value, did, did you catch the test statistic as F? Named after Fisher, who designed this monster. All you guys got to do is make your own test, put your name on it. That's why I call it the C-test on your exam, the clash. Thank you, rest in peace, Joe Strummer. So, Renee, when you say large P, large F value, you're sliding down this scale right there. The further out you go, the smaller P is getting. It's just like goodness of fit in that respect. The further away you get from this, this vertical axis, the more significant the difference is showing. So if the P value is larger than 5%, 5% same. then the scale on the F is bigger. The scale on the F is bigger. Like, if it is larger than 1, it's not significantly larger than 1. Got I got you. You're, so you're actually looking at this ratio and trying to make sense of this ratio. That has even less... Honestly, this is a great question. Remember how the Goff test statistic chi-square was some measure down on an axis somewhere that had a p-value tied to it? This is the same way. Mm -hmm. But this one's even goofier because essentially what this is is the ratio of two, two chi-squared variables. So when you have a chi-squared variable and I tell you that, okay, it means something, but it constantly changes with the sample size and how many right. categories you have, this changes even more so because you've got the ratio of two of them. So don't get too hung up on that. Except for the fact that the further this gets away from one, yeah. the more significant the difference. As far as how far does it have to get away from one, which is always Kate's awesome question, yeah. that's where your p-value comes in. Okay. Now, I haven't given you a p-value for this monster yet. That's because Excel doesn't do a very good job at it. it. Actually, everything I've done so far, it's actually had plenty of rounding errors in. Because some of its calculations are actually wrong that I had to use for this. You wouldn't do ANOVA in Excel in a research paper. You do it in some other program that your, your advisor would give you. That's why I gave you the data list. We're going to run through the TI real quick. Bag out the value, get you a p value and a test statistic, get this quiz turned in for your last quiz if you want to do it. So fire it up. Brandon, would you mind one set of lights? would be great. That's all we're going to have to do. Let's come over here. I apologize. I try to make that as painless as possible. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a trivially easy idea. I thank Fisher, well he's 